Hello and welcome to Wilson Center Now, a production of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. I'm John Molesky. My guest today is Bradley Jardine. Bradley is a global fellow with the Wilson Center's Kissinger Institute on China and the United States. We're here to talk about his new publication, Great Wall of Steel, China's Global Campaign to Suppress the Uyghurs. Bradley, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. A pleasure. Terrific piece. Just got finished reading it right up to the the last minute here, cramming for our exam. And I thought it might be useful to begin with some basics. You know, you've been following this story for a long time. It's made headlines over the last couple of years. I've been tuned into it, but I'm sure there are people who are not, particularly with all the world's attention focused on Ukraine. So maybe if you could tell us a sort of brief summary of plot, who the Uyghurs are and why China has targeted them. Mm -hmm. And the Uyghurs are a Turkic, largely a Muslim minority group within Western China. They share a lot of cultural similarities with the neighboring post-Soviet Central Asian republics across the border, places such as Kazakhstan. Um, Now, of course, within Xinjiang, since 2017, there's been headline grabbing um, information about detention centers where up to 1.8 million of these Uyghurs have been placed for re-education or having their cultural norms eroded gradually by the Chinese state and um, being submerged within what what people would term a Han-centric, Sinified vision of um, the region. So this has captured a lot of international headlines um, and a lot of attention has been focused on what's happening within Xinjiang, some of the horrors and atrocities, of course, the, the mass internment, but also the forced labor programs were including um, manufacturing, such as solar panels. Uh, these labor, these um, supply chains have been tainted with forced Uyghur labor, which is part of the program which China is implementing within Xinjiang. My research takes this conversation a step further by looking externally. So looking at how these atrocities don't just stop at China's borders, they actually expand into neighboring republics, particularly Central Asia, but also places such as Pakistan and the Middle East, where there's growing focus by China and its security services to detain Uyghurs who are even living outside far beyond the borders of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Does China have any legitimate security concerns in this regard, or is this just a control impulse? Yeah, so there's a long um, issue with the region fitting within um, China's conception of basically post-imperial state to a nation state. Xinjiang has never quite fit neatly within um, China's nation building projects. And this has been, this tension has been exacerbated by China's policy for the region, which has long been, um, what some scholars refer to as settler colonialism a strategy by which China moves ethnic Han peoples into the Xinjiang region as a means of pacifying it rather than developing the region and empowering the local population and integrating them within the broader Chinese economy, there's been a feeling of deepening marginalization. And this has often led to bouts of violence um, throughout the modern um, Xinjiang history from the 1990s onward. Um, most glaringly in 2009, when there were mass ethnic riots between ethnic Han and ethnic Uyghurs um, within the, the city of Urumqi. This um, you know, outpouring of violence shocked the world and, and shocked China, and it really resulted in a, in a huge um, growing security dragnet in response. And since then, there's really been a lot of skirmishes between security forces in China, and retaliatory attacks um, that were initially confined to Xinjiang, but gradually spread to broader um, parts of China. So uh, most well known is probably the Kunming attack of 2019, where um, Uyghurs had, um, with knives, attacked Chinese citizens in a railway station in Yunnan province in southern China. And this, since then, there's really been growing and heightened escalation of um, security services. Um, and the region, and it's led to atrocities. So a lot of the time, um, China frames these as acts of terrorism, the transnational terror networks. Um, there's very uh, little, if any, evidence that there is a sustained terror threat within Xinjiang. Certainly no Uyghurs with direct connections to well-known global terror outfits such as Al-Qaeda. Um, one of the groups that often gains attention is the Turkestan Islamic Party, 
which was a small scale Uyghur group based in um, Pakistan and now has factions within Syria fighting in the Syrian civil war. Um, but these have largely not been, there's not been any attacks attributed to them in an international sense, nothing coordinated beyond the borders of, um, of Syria. Um, and often China will claim that they're waging attacks within Xinjiang. Really what we see is localized violence um, or incidents that flare up into violence due to the security situation. So, so for example, there have been incidents where Chinese security services have forcibly removed, say, the veil of an Uyghur woman during her wedding, which has sparked violent reprisals from um, attendees at the wedding and subsequent um, killing using firearms from security services. So it's these sort of tense um, escalatory dynamics that really result in the violence rather than some deep-rooted um, terror threat or even a separatist threat. So the the things that you describe happening within China and things like the forced labor and the uh, indoctrination camps or re-education camps or whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, those were the things that resulted in things like the diplomatic boycott of the Olympics. But your report, the revelatory uh, aspect of your report, is that this is not just happening within China's borders. And you use the term transnational repression. What form does that take when you're when an, an autocratic uh, government is operating outside its own borders? What are the tools that they can use to oppress or suppress a, a minority group outside of their country? Yeah, transnational repression is the framework I use for understanding China's pursuit of Uyghurs overseas. And really by transnational repression, I mean any methods by which to coerce um, activists or even um, ordinary Uyghur citizens in the diaspora overseas and deter them from any political activism or engagement in politics. And these methods can range from the, the most extreme cases, which would be assassination or um, renditions, so whereby Uyghurs are detained within countries where they reside and they are deported back to China, either using extradition treaties or even manipulation of international institutions such as um, Chinese organizations like the, uh, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization or the international policing um, organization Interpol, which China has issued red notices in the past against Uyghurs, which has led to their detention. And the far more common place I refer to is the, you know, the so-called everyday instances of transnational repression are things such as cyber attacks. Cyberspace has become a very grow um, large growing front for transnational repression, not just China, but other autocracies as well, such as Russia, Turkey, um, Rwanda. And the reason for this is cyberspace is, is very cheap to pursue Uyghurs or other minorities or activists and it's possible to install malware, um, surveillance where keep tabs on them at much cheaper rate than having informants, although China does maintain large numbers of informants on Uyghurs as well. And the other two most um, widespread mechanisms that China manipulates are denial of consular services. So many Uyghurs can't renew their passports overseas. This effectively leaves them stateless, which means that they're vulnerable um, within the countries where they reside, and this makes them particularly susceptible to being deported um, for violating immigration rules um, due to having expired passports. And the other is threats to family members, what I call coercion by proxy. Due to the scale of the mass internment within Xinjiang itself of 1.8 million Uyghurs, this means that many of these are, are relatives of Uyghur diaspora members residing overseas. So this grants China security services a huge uh, degree of leverage um, to silence or curtail any activism. Are the host countries in these cases, are, are they complicit or complacent? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of both. The, the larger data set I work with identifies 44 countries, including in North America and Europe. These are complacent, and by complacent, I mean the Uyghurs there are primarily targeted using cyber attacks and such things. This is part of our broader um, problems of cyberspace in general, how we regulate it and how we protect citizens online. Um, but then there are also members that are complicit, and many of these have been in the, the Muslim world, 
um, which surprises a lot of commentators. But of course, the Muslim world is, is diverse and there are a lot of diverse interests. And you really see that manifesting itself within um, different states and, and why they are, they're willing to sacrifice their Uyghur citizens or residents um, for broader geopolitical goals. For example, Pakistan is one of the, the longest um, partners of China and also one of the first really to engage in mass deportation of Uyghurs in 1997. That's the earliest documented incident I have. Of course, Pakistan receives a lot of um, weapons, which it uses to modernize its, its military, which it sees as part of its broader front and its, its perceived struggle with India. So that really motivates uh, deeper cooperation between the two, and often Uyghurs are caught in the middle of this. In places okay. such as Saudi Arabia in the Middle East, you've seen far more growing Chinese presence, particularly post-2013, largely driven by economic and trade agreements. And oftentimes, some of these trade agreements, such as in the case of Morocco, where it's a strategic trade agreement made with China, you'll see that there are extradition treaties embedded within some of these uh, legal documents that the two sign. And this has actually recently been weaponized against an Uyghur named Idris Hassan, who remains in detention in Morocco and is at threat of immediate deportation. Um, local courts have flagged due to the existence of this treaty. And if, if I understand this right, China has attempted to claim a certain legitimacy of these actions based on uh, just claiming it's part of the global war on terror. Yeah, one of the, the big shifts really in China's campaign against Uyghurs was the onset of the war on terror. Pre-2001, China always framed its struggles with Uyghurs through the frameworks of either criminal activities or separatism the terms used. Post-2002, it's almost exclusively terrorism. This was a way for China to bridge its relations with the United States at the time, being seen as a cooperative partner but in the war on terror, but also to target um, its own dissidents or exiles or political activists um, using this new language of war on terror. And it's the same language it uses um, over, overseas. You see Uyghur activists who are detained in places such as Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, and other in parts of the Middle East as well. Um, you always see the accusation of terrorism, often most of the time ill-founded, um, there's very little evidence, and oftentimes these testimonies that the evidence is based on for these is based um, on interviews with people back in Xinjiang, who many of them have been coerced through violence or torture, um, according to human rights reporting on these accounts that are released. And could you uh, tell us about the choice of the words in the title, The Great Wall of Steel? I know it's a historic reference. Can you tell our viewers about that? Yeah, The Great Wall of Steel really is started at, um, coming back in Xi Jinping's rhetoric of late. And it refers to this idea of the strengthening of the Chinese nation, but strengthening against um, any divisions within society, divisions such as um, different ethnicities or even different languages, there's so on that can be weaponized by, in, in the, the CCP's view, um, against China um, by outsiders or outside powers such as the United States. So it's really a, a consolidation of the Chinese state the, um, do you connect the dots to the global rise of autocracy? You know, we've seen perhaps a little pause in that as a result of Russia's invasion of Ukraine, but the trend lines in recent years have been a democracy somewhat in retreat and autocracy somewhat in ascension. Do you connect dots between China and its tactics, particularly with those nations that are complicit with their attempt to oppress Uyghurs outside of Chinese borders? Yeah, there's definitely a, a growing problem. And with transnational repression, <clears throat> it really does demonstrate the rise of autocracy because these incidents have been on the rise in the past decade, um, not just with China, but with other regimes such as Turkey's, um, Iran's, North Korea's, Russia's, all have been pursuing um, dissidents overseas. Part of this is, of course, as you mentioned, the, the retreat of democracy or the, not so much the retreat, but the growing relative power of 
autocratic parts of the world with countries such as China that have their very own independent economic agendas um, and they have a lot more influence than ever ever before and oftentimes this economic influence is traded for political influence such as for transnational repression and pursuit of dissidents. Part of it as well is the, the rise of global civil society. In the past autocrats sometimes um, relied on refugees or not refugees sorry but diaspora communities because diasporas were a source of income that would come back to the to their country and help develop it so in, in the past these communities were seen as um, important to the development of the state particularly for china in the 1980s but over time now with with social media and so on many of these communities have now been empowered for activism or for pushing for change back in their home state and this has made them a growing target um, or perceived threat for many autocracies, which has also led to an escalation in um, the use of cyberspace for targeting them through hacks, smear campaigns, etc. And in addition to that, there's just the relative costs that now it's cheaper than ever before for autocracies to pursue their critics abroad, um, particularly using these, these digital methods or the exportation of um, surveillance where um, to neighboring states. The double-edged sword of, uh, of technology, right? It can be used for good or for evil. The uh, the uh, whether the repression is taking place within the borders or the transnational repression that you documented in your excellent report, uh, I, I think it's important that our viewers understand what you're describing is not something that is static. Uh, it's a rising tide. This activity is increasing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And you know, I, I broke down the data in the case of the the Uyghurs, but it works out at um, an average of two cases per week of Uyghurs who are targeted overseas, and that's been the case for uh, twenty years. So if you average out the data over a course of twenty years, there's been two Uyghurs every week who've been detained, and that's just China. When you compare it, as Freedom House has done with transnational repression more broadly among other states. Um, we really see that it's a growing phenomenon and it's only accelerating and it's becoming more um, overt as well. I mean, we've seen with Belarus, the hijacking of an airline in European airspace to detain a blogger. Um, so these extraterritorial methods are just becoming very brazen um, at present. Now, you make a, a, a wide uh, list of recommendations of things that can be done uh, by the U.S., by other members of the international community. Uh, I would recommend that people who are interested should go to wilsoncenter.org and find your complete excellent report, and, and they can dive into all the details and all the documentation that you provide. But for the purpose of, of this discussion, Bradley, if you could give us an overview of some of the key points that you would recommend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the, the most common policy recommendations or requests actually that comes from my conversations with members of the Uyghur diaspora is the need for more refugee quotas for Uyghurs within Western societies within the United States and within Europe. Um, and this would be not just for Uyghurs leaving China, but also for Uyghurs in third countries where they're at risk of detention or deportation, such as Thailand, which is a large case, or the Middle East, particularly Egypt. There should be a lot more um, quotas issued to bring them to safer jurisdictions. Of course, they won't be entirely safe from the harms of cyber attacks, um, but that will be an ongoing discussion in the West over broader themes of the rights to digital privacy and, and so on. So I think that we need to understand trans transnational repression as being embedded within these wider um, themes of digital rights. Um, as for transnational repression, it does need to be recognized more at an international level as well. I think there should be a UN special rapporteur on transnational repression who um, provides regular reports, um, documenting the phenomenon and providing the, the legal language necessary for states to litigate and um, pursue states who are engaging in this practice. There should be more limits on the spread of um, surveillance where that's a very unregulated market at the moment. A lot of autocracies are gaining um, equipment that's allowing them to build databases, such as the case of China, um, which has deep-seated um, racial profiling components, which should be alarming um, to any activist, particularly in the United States. And I think we need to think about these technologies and how better to, to regulate their um, spread around the world. Who, who's focusing on this? Who are, are, who are the champions for the Uyghurs? 
um, within the Uyghur community or, or just uh, anywhere uh, globally? I mean, uh, your your work certainly would put you into that category, uh, drawing attention to it. But more than that, uh, analyzing it in a way that's really useful. Are are there others who are out there who are are you know uh, speaking from or, or what's the expression singing from the same hymn book? <laughs> Um, yeah, of course, the Uyghur civil society itself has been at the, the, the front lines of raising awareness of this phenomenon, um, which is very important. A lot of Uyghur speakers have become very prominent in calling against um, China's transnational repression. And I would stress that there's a reason that China targets um, Uyghurs in particular. It's because their voices are more powerful. When they speak of the traumas that they've suffered or that their families are suffering in Xinjiang, it's far more effective messaging than if someone such as myself is discussing um, these issues. And so I think that, that that needs to be raised as an important point for particularly why they're targeted and why China pursues um, activists overseas. They do carry a lot of weight and it has influenced policy which has led to the United States itself taking a lead on policies for combating um, the atrocities taking place in Xinjiang, some of the acts that have been passed, um, and of course the, the lead on the boycott of the Olympics. Of course, it hasn't gone far enough as noted, a lot more could be done in terms of refugee quotas, but the US has definitely taken a lead. The European Union's become far more critical as well. Um, and I think there's a lot more sustained interest from governments now in the concept of transnational repression is becoming more widely um, talked about by leaders, by civil society activists, and by international institutions. So I think it's slowly becoming more codified, and over time that will lead to far more accountability. I want to ask you uh, one final question, Bradley, and it's sort of a pulling back the veil on the writer's mind when someone sits down to write a book or a report or, you know, I'm always intrigued by the first sentence and the last sentence, you know, how, how someone chooses to begin, how they choose to end. And I think you, you'll read outstanding books that sort of end with a whimper because uh, it's hard to make a final statement. Your final statement is a bit dramatic. Uh, the international community must work with the Uyghur people to reverse the rising tide of autocracy and curtail the spread of transnational repression. And I want to focus on these words before it's too late. Uh, explain to us your thoughts on on why you ended there and what you mean by before it's too late. How much urgency are, are you describing? Yeah, great, great question. Um, yeah, I think we, we discussed this um, earlier, but with autocracy, the um, it's there's a lack of restrictions on what states can do. You know, using these brazen attacks, such as the Skripal poisonings by Russia is another example. There's very little pushback um, from the West. So the punishments seem um, not great enough to prevent such atrocities. If we can't prevent people being poisoned within our borders, what other sorts of atrocities does this invite um, by autocracies? And I think that these attacks are becoming a lot more high profile. They're becoming a lot more dangerous and threatening. Assassinations have been on the rise as well um, from other states, less so China against Uyghurs. But the cyberspace um, attacks are themselves worrying. So what people should be aware of is that the Uyghur issue is of course important and we should focus on it in and of itself, but also speaks to a much broader question. China's already building databases of China scholars and analysts within the West who are on social media and publishing in newspapers. They will also be victims of smear campaigns, attacks on their credibility, DDoS attacks on organizations and institutions, hacks, all of it interferes with our abilities to engage in civil society and to have honest conversations. Um, so I think for maintaining our democracy, maintaining our institutions, we really need to push back on transnational repression before it's too late in the sense that it really will erode um, our own societies. The report is Great Wall of Steel, China's global campaign to suppress the Uyghurs. It's available at Wilson.org. And the author, Bradley Jardine, has been our guest today. Bradley, thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, John. A pleasure. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this edition of Wilson Center now and that you'll choose to join us again soon. Until then, for all of us at the Center, I'm John Molesky. Thanks for being here.